short demonstration of the Socratic method here. And um, I know a lot of people liked uh, the, the talks of uh, Diana Martin and Butler Schaefer, so th this is another opportunity to listen to them. Uh, but Butler Schaefer will be interviewing Dana using the Socratic method. beneficial for unschooling. Now, where, where are the kids? How are the kids where they are? Do you ask them to be there? Do you go to where they are? I think the perfect physical environment is based on the individual child. It's not a big mystery to me, and I don't assume that I know better than my children and where they learn best. They tell me, we have an open relationship, and the fact that they communicate with me my son Devin learns best out in nature, because I, he tells me. And my daughter Tiffany likes a more um, setting that's really busy with a lot of activities and a lot of options. So the best environment, I just ask my kids and they tell me that I meet that need. Are there any subject areas that you would consider mandatory for the kids to learn? Say is it math or something like that. If he has a child, I don't want to learn math. I'm going to be an artist someday or something, I don't know math. Um, is there anything like that, any subject that you say, well, I would like to have you do it anyway? Well, we don't break life down into subjects at all. So, no, there is no subject. In the real world, you don't break life down into subjects. It's really a conditioned of mentalization of education that is not part of our reality. So no, there's, there's not. How, how would a, a question involving uh, learning of math come up? How would the question of learning math for your kids come up? Math is not separate from life. So there's never a, a point where I'm withdrawing that from a learning situation saying you just learned math. Math is a side effect of learning and pursuing their passions. So it's not just like we don't do we didn't do that today. Nobody pulled out and pointed out, ooh, he just talked about math and she talked about science. 
was just learning and it was life and it wasn't separate. So um, my kids learn math just through living life and pursuing their passions, the side effect of it. Are there any situations, or could you describe some of the situations where your children would find it useful to know, let's say math, I'm just using that as an example. Uh, they might find it beneficial to what they're interested in, that you'd say, all right, let's, let's do the multiplication tables or whatever, whatever it might be. Is there any situation where that comes up from the, from the kid's point of view? I need to know something about arithmetic. I need to know something about geometry. The only time it would come up is if my children needed to learn it in the moment. For example, my son Devin uh, built a survival shelter recently, and he needed to measure and figure things out. So when it's a real life context for them, they pick it up as they do it. So no, there's never been a time where I said you have to learn multiplication. They have calculators if they need to know. They've never memorized the times tables yet. They know, not by memorization, but because they know how to multiply. And in fact, the way that most of us learned math was so limiting, because math is a really creative thing. And my son, Orion, he's kind of the, the math wins of the house in our family. And he comes up with, you can give him any number and he can add it or multiply it. And the way that he goes about doing that is really personal to him. So we've been taught that math is really hard and that there's one or two ways to go about it, when in fact there are hundreds of ways to go about learning math. And when you don't say that this is the right way, your kids are open to learning so many other ways. But I know that's really outside the box of what most people think math to be. In terms of the unschooling system, I don't want to call it a method, I think that's a little... And the instruction is probably a little beyond what you characterize it, but the system, the process. Um, are there any uh, means that are used in that system generally, not just with you, but with other people that you know of, or as a special means of children? I'm thinking in terms of Maria Montessori when she had her school. She, had, she dealt with a lot of children who had developmental problems and Down syndrome and so forth. Are there any particular methods or processes in unschooling that would be, that would be, that would work for a child with uh, learning difficulties like that that might not be for a normal child? trust parents when it comes to raising their own kids, regardless of what issues the children may have. And I've worked with parents with children with labeled ADHD and Asperger's and even Down syndrome, three or four families. And the truth is, they tell me that the more freedom these kids receive, the better that they do you know, in an environment where the parents are very involved. In fact, it were these, it's these kids with these labels where the institution tries to control them the most. My mother-in-law was um, a woman who worked with a child with Down syndrome, and when I was around them, spending time with them, it was painful to see how much obedience was the focus of training these kids. It was like dog training, and it was really disrespectful. It could bring me to the point of tears thinking about how that was measured in success, is when you can get these kids to obey, then you've succeeded. And I, I find it um, really unjust. And so when I'm working with parents, I like for them to tap into what their instincts are. They can use a, a number of methodologies or beliefs, but really find what works for their individual child in that case. So I believe unschooling can work um, for children with disabilities, labels. I don't necessarily believe in ADHD, but that's another whole conversation. I think too many kids are drugged in our culture, um, way too many, all for the convenience of the schools, and it's really a crisis right now. Part of the reason I asked that question, when my wife was teaching in Montessori school, there was a young boy with Down syndrome. He had a very, very severe case, and I think the parents knew the kid wasn't going to be around much longer. And friends of the parents said, why do you spend so much time and money on this boy knowing that he's, uh, he's probably not going to live much longer? And they came up with the most beautiful answer, just People you sometimes love just for one thing that comes out of their mouth. They said that um, he's going to get the best 
learning that's available to him as a human being, whether he dies tomorrow or five years from tomorrow. We want him to be able to live at the highest level he's capable of expressing. I thought that's, what if we all were in schools that way, or in families that way? Which leads me to another question. Um, I have the feeling that you don't really have school time set forth in your house, is that right? Yeah. So how how would you say a, a typical learning day might might come about? Well, first of all, we don't separate learning from life. It's not something we pull out and say, now it's time to learn. Uh, that would be really limiting. In fact, life is about learning, and our kids learn from everything they do. So learning never ends, so their school day is from the moment they wake up till they go to bed. But a typical day, that's always a hard question for me because it looks different every single day. Um, it's probably what a lot of people do on weekends, what we do every day. And a lot of times we don't know what day it is and we may not even know what time it is. We just live life in the moment. Um, but a typical day, what do you think? The day before I came here, my son Devin woke up and I brought him to get more coal. I'm facilitating a blacksmith, there's a lot of hands on. I brought him to Home Depot to pick out some wood. He's making a longbow. And at the same time, my son Orion wanted to go, um, he's really into big rig trucks, so we went to a, a pit, a sand pit to watch some of the trucks, and then we Googled and researched what some of those, um, what they do and how they function, and then he's into dinosaurs, we watched a documentary on dinosaurs. So, so the learning flows really naturally, and we're just guided by, by that. My daughter Tiffany faced with me for money, so I sent her some money through PayPal, which is in New York City. Seems like 12 year olds really are, that's pretty much the facilitation at this point. But, um, yeah. Oh, I was so curious. Why? I think it's particularly little boys, at least it's in some of our, one of our grandchildren, are really interested in dinosaurs. And I often wonder, why not cows or chickens or something? Why, why dinosaurs? But um, um, how do you deal with, let's say, a conflict between two of your kids, or if you're in a broader setting where you have kids from other families who are also participating in the unschooling process. How do you deal with conflicts? That's an excellent question. It came up authentically last night. I got back to my hotel room, and there was a message from my friend, where my, my daughter Tiffany is in New York. By the way, her real name is not Tiffany, it's Dakota. And when she was four years old, she told me that that wasn't her name. She did not feel like a Dakota and wanted to change her name to Tiffany. And I respected that. And she's legally going to change it soon, but it's been since she was four, and she's almost 13. Um, that caused a lot of problems in the family. But my friend um, messaged me and said, um, Tiffany's having a hard time with this girl, Lindsay, who's staying with us. And at the same time, Tiffany was messaging me, saying, I, I hate Lindsay. She's giving me the finger when nobody's looking. And this girl goes to school. And she's, calling, she's whispering to other people about me, and I, and I um, don't want her to come home with us because she was going to come stay with us for a while. And so I messaged Kathy and said, hey, we have an issue. How can we resolve this? And I said, why don't you, you have a circle? So we call these things called, called circles, where you get together with a group and you just share your thoughts and your feelings. And so she said, okay, and organize a circle. So her and about eight girls, preteen girls, got together last night, and they decided to go around and share what annoys them about each other one by one, and in doing so, um, we, she and I facilitated me from being all the way over here and her in New York, these girls to open up discussion and dialogue that it really hurts me when you do this, and why are you doing it, why are you giving me the finger, and they were able, it was a two and a half hour circle, they were able to resolve the issue, and I got a message when I woke up this morning from Kathy saying everything's fine, everyone's getting along great, no problem, Lindsay's coming home with you, and um, thank you for opening dialogue, I think when there's problems between um, your children and another parent, you almost become angry at the other parent. A lot of times it doesn't, you're not working in partnership with people, you get um, a lot built. So I um, like to lay things on the line if I'm feeling something with somebody. And um, yeah, it was a peaceful resolution instead of a building. So that's one example. With unschooling generally, I'm just going to imagine that you had two parents who might both have to work during the day. And the child or children of that family might be under the watch of somebody else, a nanny or someone like that that might be hired. 
what problems or what process do you go through to make certain that the person that is going to have that care of your children during the day is going to behave consistently with the way you want your children to be living? I love these questions. They're so great. I love these questions. They're great. Um, well, they're coming from me, kiddo. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta interview people. Um, I have a friend over in the UK, in uh, Ireland, who has nannies. And um, she interviews them. She's only recently come to this leg, and she fired one. But she interviews them and educates them about this philosophy and shares what partnership-based parenting is all about and what her expectations are. And you can interview people and find out where they stand. And I think this is going to be something that's really needed. In fact, I'm having the image of a website of parents being able to connect and find caregivers um, and pulling together people that really understand peaceful parenting, unschooling philosophy, and partnership-based parenting, but just communication. And if you don't agree with the way somebody's treating your children, then don't have them go with them. But there are several parents who unschool, hundreds in fact, who have both parents working and they work it out, and they have extended family who are supportive of the philosophy or friends. So you can always find somebody. Or you work two separate shifts and you take turns you know, as parents. But. How do you, or, or do you have a way of bringing materials into the house or wherever the children are, uh, just to kind of interest them in a subject area that you might not even show that to them or talk to them about it, but just, just having it there to, to look at, say, a book about dinosaurs or something like that, or geology or what it might be? Uh, what, is your, what is your thinking on that? Well, if you're a parent new to this life, it can be really helpful for you to get, there's a series of books called What Every First Grader Needs to Know, What Every Second Grader Needs to Know. It goes all the way up, I think, to ninth grade. So early on, when we, were, when we needed an evaluator, I would get one of the books, I would order it on Amazon and find out what was being introduced. I think it was second grade that the presidents were introduced in slavery, for example. So I went online and ordered the president's placemats, put them in the kitchen, um, I did the same thing, we got some books and a documentary on the history of slavery and so forth. So at that time, when I hadn't got to the point of um, being more free with what we were introduced to and so forth, I would do that. I would put around different things, and it's called strewing, when you strew about interesting. I think Montessori is really big with putting things around like that, and I, I love the Montessori method and implementing certain things. So if I know my kids are interested in something, you, know, you can find great stuff on eBay, yard sales, um, it doesn't have to cost a fortune, but if I see something like the world map puzzle, I get the big world map floor puzzle for the kids, and um, yeah, our home is rich with resources. We have the libraries, huge craft area. We don't have a dining room. It used to be it used to be really pretty. Now it's it's a craft area with every craft you could think of. And um, I want my home. My my house is not a museum of our things. It's a workshop of our interests. And so it's a completely different intent in what our home is used for than the average person. And when you come into our home, I want it to be a place that's cozy and a place that the kids want to be, but a, an introduction to a lot of different topics. So we have globes, but it doesn't look like a schoolroom. It just looks like a really fun, interesting place. Would they have areas where they would perhaps might be expected to do artwork if you wanted to do if they wanted to do some painting? Is there an area where you would designate the painting or the sculpting or whatever else we're going to do? You do that in this particular room? Uh, no, there's not a designated area. Um, I keep all the craft things in a certain area, but they have the freedom to use anywhere in the home. But for example, my daughter Ivy, she loves to do crafts on the tray table on the couch. So I make sure that there's a tablecloth down and I just tell her I don't want anything to get on the couch, so I'm going to put this down first. And so my need for my couch not to get clay all over it and her need to explore where she feels inspired to, we collaborate, we find a way so both of our needs are met. So there's no designated area. I think I know the answer to this question because you kind of prefaced your presentation uh, earlier about you became interested in this when um, your first pregnancy and you saw the pictures of dead children and so forth. And Newsreel, and news, news stations, and so on. Could you elaborate a little bit on what was going on in your own mind that led you to uh, 
get into this area of learning for your children rather than any other traditional or Montessori or whatever. But what was going on in your head? No, I never really thought about it in that way, but I just put, led, put one foot in front of the other and attachment parenting was, I didn't even know it was called that, it was just more of an instinctual thing and it just extended and I found that there was a label for it called on schooling. And so for me, it was more of an instinctual um, guide. Online, um, the first place was the Natural Child Project. I've since become good friends with the owner. She has the oldest uh, unschooling and natural parenting website. I think it came out right when the internet was born. Or so it came out. Jan Hunt is her name, and she has an amazing link of uh, unschooling resources. And I remember the first time I read it, I was like, this is crazy. Like, are you serious? There's no schoolwork? I had never heard of anything like it. And then the more I read, the more it made sense. So I think when you first hear about this philosophy, the natural response is shock. It's like, how can that be? Is that, we were on the Jeff Probst show. He's the dude that does Survivor. Do you know who he is? He, he had a talk show for a while, and my son and I were on his show. And the first question he asked me, is that legal? <laughs> and I said, yeah. Like, is freedom legal? Is what he was asking me. And it was a, it was, I've done a few interviews since where they use that one clip from the Jeff Probst show to kind of introduce me and, um, yeah, so this just happened really naturally for me. It was something that I just listened to my heart and it guided me and that's why I like to say that I think a lot of you deep down, I'm sure some things I share with you really touched on either your own childhood, something you knew was, was off, you know, the, living in a situation of injustice on some level and me validating that no, you weren't wrong. You weren't wrong all those years. Your instinct was right. You didn't deserve to be treated that way. You should have had more rights. You should have had more freedoms. I think that could be really healing for people. So what led me, my heart, and I love to help other people listen to their hearts because I think we're so closed off from knowing the truth. I heard two or three people here today use the word crazy. People think we're crazy or something that you just made some reference to. I uh, just sort of wonder as an aside if, uh, if you don't have to be a little bit crazy in this world to keep from going insane. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like the people that you <laughs> kind of admire for having stepped outside the circle and say, no, no, there's, there's a better way of doing this. And, you know, when you're standing outside the circle, you always look crazy to the people who are inside. Um, if, if you have Let's say a child who is very interested in some topic and wants to learn more about it, but uh, do you, I think I know what the answer is going to be, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If the kid suddenly becomes, let's say basically loses direction in what he's doing, what would be your response to that? In other words, you talking about dinosaurs and then all of a sudden he's off talking about something else. Well, he's done, obviously, with that topic. He's done with that focus. Um, his, their agenda comes before mine, and I facilitate it, but there's no concept of quitting in our life. Um, quitting is really a concept based on somebody else thinking that you should have finished more of what you were doing. We just finish what we choose. Um, but that, again, is a challenging notion for people to really understand. Um, my kids, we, study as much as they want of a topic till they're done, till they're satisfied. And have you ever studied anything or learned anything and you stopped for a while and then you went back to it when you were more emotionally or developmentally ready to pick it up? That happens naturally and I know that. So when my kids are into something and then they stop for a while and go on to something else, I respect that time because much of the time where our kids aren't, they don't look like they're doing anything is when everything's being really integrated. It's that time that looks like boredom, it's that quiet time where things are really being absorbed and learned for all of us as humans. So I, I truly, I don't judge it, I just follow a cue. And I say, all right, if you're ready to dive into that again, I'm here. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I, I long been a believer in the idea that children need a lot of just quiet time on their own. And I find that there are a lot of parents who sort of micromanage the kids' schedule and right? have this, this hour and something else. Some other time and so forth. Um, 
have you found this through this process your children interested in just being by themselves to think some of this through? Yeah, just like me. You know, a lot of us sometimes we like time alone and sometimes we don't. So and I think every individual is different. My son Devin really likes time alone in the woods is where he goes. He's He's the primitive wild boy of the family. If you were to, it's funny because if I was to bring just one of my kids in here, like him, you'd be like, whoa, this is, a, what is going on here? He's a wild hippie child. I mean, he hunts for his food. He makes his own clothes. He doesn't buy, he does not want to buy into anything in modern culture. He will not give Walmart any store money. He says, no way in hell am I paying someone to clothe me when I can do it myself. He is a one amazing individual. And then my daughter Tiffany, on the other hand, designer, loves designer things. And like I said before, she's at a celebrity fashion show right now in New York City. And so, but I want this to show you that this life is about nurturing who your children are as individuals. Who, who are they meant to be? Who are they meant to become? And I honor that and I don't judge it. I don't judge their interests. I don't judge the fact that my daughter Tiffany is into the band One Direction at any less of value as my son who's studying um, ancient Egypt. It's all of value. And I know that everything my kids are interested in is an extension of themselves. And if I judge that, they really internalize that and see it as a judgment on who they are. So I love them for whoever they are, be, be them primitive wild child or total mainstream um, person into One Direction. I'm going to One Direction in a couple days. <laughs> Just to support my daughter. <laughs> where, where would one find your book? I have six copies left here, but um, Amazon or any major bookstore, Barnes & Noble. I think the superintendent or chief <laughs> for the school here has a question. Thank you very much, Dana. Thank you very much.